We all devour stories from war-torn countries and watch the reporters on TV with rubble and destruction in the background. What kind of job is that? And who are the brave journalists who bring us these stories? I'm Pods with my co-host, Matt Robeson, and this is Beyond Politics. Our guest today is one of those brave journalists, Sean Carberry, a veteran war correspondent for NPR, whose resume also includes working for the Inspector General on Afghanistan, has a new book out. It's called Passport Stamps. Sean, welcome back to Beyond Politics. Thanks, Paul. Matt, great to be with you as always. So tell our folks, what I want to know, what was the most dangerous moment for you personally in all of your reporting? I could argue that the most dangerous moment was in the summer of 2012. I was interviewing a group of Afghan Kuchis who are basically nomads, the poorest of the poor in Afghanistan. And they lived near a firing range near Bagram Airfield. And members of their community would graze animals there. They would pick up scrap metal and suffer sometimes catastrophic injuries. So I'm sitting in this little abandoned house that they were squatting in, talking to them about the situation. The father is there missing part of a leg. Son is there with his arms gone below the elbows and talking about this, this tragic circumstances of them and their plight. And so in the middle of the conversation, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, someone walking into the room with this wooden tray and this sort of oozing gelatinous white goo on the tray and flies buzzing around it. And I'm looking and they bring it in and person says something. My interpreter says to me, they want to share their traditional homemade cheese with me. And I'm sitting there looking at this stuff, just thinking about all the other times I've had food poisoning around the world in my reporting and travels. There's no way I can eat this, but there's also no way I can refuse their hospitality. This is just, it's a cultural thing. You can't say no. So I'm just sitting there racking my brain for a way out. And so I just turned to my interpreter and I said, look, I don't know how you translate this, but can you thank them profusely for me? Tell them I'm honored, appreciate them sharing their culture with me, but I have an allergy to dairy products. I play the lactose intolerance card. It actually translated as my interpreter is saying this to the people I see heads. I dodge that bullet. And honestly, obviously kidding a bit, but one of the realities of doing this kind of work is often the most dangerous moments aren't conflict related per se. It's, it is food. It's travel. I was in what was a pretty significant car accident in Rwanda once when I was driver was taking me into the Congo, totaled the car. Fortunately, I just had some some minor bruising, but some of those things were more dangerous. I want to talk about another aspect of danger here. You open the book mid scene and you're in some significant danger in Sudan. You describe <clears throat> being stopped by four random men with Kalashnikovs demanding your papers. And it just so happened you didn't have your passport with me. This happens over and over to you. And it makes me wonder when you hand over your passport, you're putting yourself in significant danger right there. If you don't have your passport, you're in trouble. You could be, and these randos with rifles could confiscate it. They could do literally anything to you. Is that always in the back of your mind? Unfortunately, not necessarily in the back, but sometimes front because it did happen a lot. So yeah, my second international reporting trip was to Sudan, which in 2007 required all sorts of paperwork and permission and just layers upon layers. You've got to get the visa. You've got to get some permissions up front. You've got to then register your passport and so just roaming around and taking a picture down a street. And then I just hear this noise behind me and I turn and these guys with Kalashnikovs come running up. And again, I initially was like, oh, they're going to run past me. Like there, there is something down the street that they're running toward. I wasn't too worried initially. And then they just stopped in front of me with the rifles pointed at me. And I, I was just so befuddled that it, it was like, hard to be scared or know how to react. And I didn't know what was going on. And they start yelling at me. And basically the issue was that I had taken a photo of the U.S. embassy, they claimed, even though my back was to it. But anyhow, yes, yeah, so they go to this stuff and demand my papers. I hand them the press card and all my paperwork from the Sudanese government. And they're like, okay, okay. They needed the passport. 
And because I didn't have it on me, they ended up marching me off to a little cell and held me and interrogated me until whatever it was, 45 minutes, an hour later, my fixer finally showed up with my passport. They looked at it and then they're like, okay, you're good to go. Actually, later on that same trip, I'm out in Darfur. I took a photo and some guys came running up to me on the street and started giving me the business. Uh, I showed them all the stuff and they quickly de-escalated and like, oh, come in for tea. And I'm like completely rattled from being practically attacked on the street. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. I'll pass on the tea. But yeah, that's the thing. You always had to have your passport on you. I want to talk to you about the CIA. It comes (laughs) up in the Belgrade chapter where you talk (laughs) about the fact quite humorously, by the way, that you were constantly mistaken for a CIA operative. And it's very funny in the book. The thing is, it's not a very funny issue. It's a real issue. The church committee back in 1976 disclosed the fact that the FBI and to a much greater extent, the CIA were truly using Western journalists, not just for information, but for cover. And in 1977, there were regulations that banned the CIA internally imposed from doing this, except under extraordinary circumstances, and they continue to do it. And this has had real consequences for people in your line of work. Terry Anderson, the longtime hostage in Beirut, AP reporter, he told the St. Petersburg Times in 1996 that his captors said that they believed all you Americans are spies, I'm quoting here, particularly those who go around asking questions, which is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was the Daniel Pearl incident, the atrocity of what happened to Daniel Pearl, which again was on the pretext of him my being a CIA spy. My own father was an overseas reporter. He worked for Life magazine. He was captured by Idi Amin at one point doing reporting in Uganda. And the very first thing that he was accused of was being a spy. And he talked his way out of it. And it turned out, here's the twist to it. My mom just dropped this bomb on me a few years ago. Actually, your dad was doing a little (laughs) side work for the CIA. Oh, oh, great. Fantastic. Yeah. So how big a problem is this, Sean? Is this an ongoing issue for our overseas reporters? Depending on the location, yeah, it, there's no question it hovers around. Serbia was interesting. Serbia, and when I was there, was one of the most anti-American places that, that I've ever been. And understandably, the way things played out in their eyes over the course of the 90s. So very anti-American. I just felt constantly being scrutinized and people looking to avoid me. But yeah, the moment I got out of the airport, I got into a taxi to my hotel in Belgrade. Taxi driver looks me up and down, just goes CIA. And I'm like, no, another thing that that's in the news, but the Palestinian refugee camp, El Helway in Lebanon. I was there in 2008 and I was interviewing a Palestinian official who was one of the senior leaders in the camp. And we're sitting in his kitchen in this, this small, rather poor house in the, uh, in the camp. And we're talking and I'm asking him questions about Lebanese politics and relations with Syria and the United States. And at one point, he leans into me and says, look, I know I'm not talking to a journalist. He says this through an interpreter, but he basically says, I want you to communicate this to Washington. And he really thought that I was an agent and he was doing like back channel messaging to the U.S. government. I I told him, I was like, look, I'm not. And he's like, okay, I know you have to say you're not, but I know you are. And that was one where, yeah, okay, that was a kind of tense setting, a lot going on in that area. And okay, this is the kind of thing where someone could decide, hey, we're going to grab this American CIA guy. So there were definitely moments where I was aware and concerned about it. I want to talk about another disconnect. I want to talk about bullshit. You describe a number of instances of getting fed bullshit. It's a theme throughout the story. We're just two months past Daniel Ellsberg passing away. Mm -hmm. And that's a reminder of just how important it is to transcend the bullshit that we sometimes feed ourselves and how important public perceptions are in wars. Two-part question. How did you transcend the bullshit and provide real factual reporting, even your own creeping sense of maybe getting a little bit of Stockholm syndrome? And how did that crucially inform you when you went to work for the inspector general, where clear-eyed realism was so important when looking at the situation in Afghanistan. How did you spot the bullshit and 
work your way around it. Yeah, hopefully I did spot enough of it. Some Sometimes you don't. That is the challenge when you're given access to a certain amount. I, there are times where it's, you're just reaching in a black box and grabbing something and thinking that's representative of what's in the box. And I think realistically, by the time I got to into theater, it was 2008, 2009, when I finally started getting into Iraq and Afghanistan, I think it had been a pretty strong body of reporting to that point about what was and wasn't bullshit. I, I had pretty good sense of things going in and knew what kinds of things were going to be said and, oh, the Iraqi forces are capable of X, Y, Z, or the Afghans can do this. And you can hear when you're being sold something. And part of the way you gut check it is somewhat built into the embed system is because you're technically on the record the whole time. You go to dinner at the dining hall in a base and a couple of young soldiers are venting and you pick up the chatter. The colonel tells you the ideal PowerPoint version of things. And then you hear a couple of sergeants or specialists saying, I can't believe that Iraqi police force commander did X, Y, Z, or we had to bail them out again. It is there. And you've just got to be cluing in and absorbing. One of the things that happened to me in Afghanistan that did carry into my work at the inspector general's office is there was such a almost sort of Manchurian candidate like recitation of talking points in Afghanistan for a while. Like everyone would talk about, look at the progress, right? You've got now... 10 million Afghans in schools, 40% are girls. I'm like, all right, I got to start digging in on this. So I went to the Ministry of Education and I sat and I talked with them and pulled out the numbers and they said, okay, yes, technically there are about nine to 10 million students enrolled on paper in school. Now we can't verify that. And we do know that a lot of those are ghost students that are there to inflate student populations so schools get more money. So they went through and they're down. We think it's around this number of actual students. Then it's of those students, 50% don't show up most days. And the reasons why, like young boys, their families will pull them out of school to have them sell plastic bags in the streets or things like that. Girls would start getting weeded out sometimes by their families at certain ages. You're going down, okay, so the real number of students is really down to here. Of that, 50% are showing up. Then the typical school day in a lot of places was about two and a half hours. So you had a lot of schools that weren't big enough, so they would do two to three sessions a day. So you're getting two and a half hours of education delivered. Then we went to some schools and talked to teachers and students and families about the curriculum. And a lot of schools, the curriculum was pretty terrible. And a lot of the teachers weren't even qualified to Afghan standards. So you really winnow down how much education was really being delivered. And it was just a minuscule fraction of this high-level talking point of 10 million Afghans in school. And even though it was a non-sexy topic, a report on education in Afghanistan, it was one where editors of other organizations commented on like to their reporters in Kabul. Like I heard a lot of feedback. That story got a lot of traction. And in 2017-18, General Nicholson was in command in Afghanistan, and he was hammering the talking points again. And talking about we're turning the corner, 80%. Once we get 80% of the population in areas under government control, then that's a tipping point. Taliban have lost all this stuff. I remember I pulled in a quote from General Dunford when he was in command saying 80% of the Afghan population are in areas under government control. And the war wasn't won. The Taliban didn't surrender. And then years later, General Nicholson is saying, once we get to a point of 80% of the population, that's the tipping point. Taliban can't win. And so I put a lot of stuff in some of those IE reports that challenging those narratives, bringing historical examples from previous commanders, secretaries of defense, saying things that, that didn't support that. And a few months later, those talking points started to disappear. Sean Carberry, your Substack 
is also called Passport Stamps. It is very worth subscribing to. The book is now out, available everywhere. And thank you so much for being with us on Beyond Politics. You're welcome. Always a pleasure to talk to you guys.